So uh, brilliant and beautiful, but wrong. Uh, this kind of title kind of came to me because lately, uh, this this summer, in fact, well, I can't get this thing to move here. All right. Does do it, does anybody know who uh, David Glertner is? He's actually a fairly well-known scientist, a computer scientist at Yale University, chief scientist at Mirror Worlds Technologies, member of the National Council of Arts, uh, pretty famous for both his specific scientific expertise and for his cultural, political, and historical reflections. So um, he just came out with an article in May of, of this year, 2019, where he basically said that uh, beautiful theory Darwinism is a, uh, a brilliant and beautiful scientific theory, but one that has now been overtaken by science, so that he's kind of given up on Darwinism, even though it was beautiful to him, because it ex as far as a scientific theory, not because of its philosophy, but because a beautiful scientific theory is something that explains all the data very well that you know of, and that's considered beautiful as far as a scientist is concerned. Of course, philosophically, it's a brutal theory, because everybody agrees it's red and tooth and claw, and it's pretty, it's brutal uh, as far as the philosophy is concerned. But as far as science is concerned, it's considered beautiful. And he said, beauty is important. Beauty is often a uh, telltale sign of truth. Beauty is our guide to in the intellectual universe, walking beside us through the uncharted wilderness, pointing us in the right direction, keeping us on track most of the time, right? So something that may initially look beautiful and very attractive, it's not always right. So he says, Darwin's main problem, however, is molecular biology. There is no such thing, there was no such thing in his own time. We now see from inside what he could only see from outside, as if he had developed a theory of mobile phone evolution without knowing that there were computers and software inside or what the digital revolution was all about. He could only see the outside of the mobile phone. Neo-Darwinism says that nature simply rolls the dice, and if something useful emerges, great. Otherwise, try again. But useful sequences are so gigantically rare that this answer simply won't work. Darwin would have easily understood that minor mutations are common but can't create significant evolutionary change, while major mutations are very rare and fatal. So... This is where he catches a lot of flack, but we'll look at it a little bit and see if he's right. So what about the fossils, though? I mean, great for molecular biology and all that, but do we really have to look at all those nitty-gritty details? Clearly, evolution happens in the fossil record. Simple to complex, it's pretty obvious. In fact, it's one of the more difficult things creationists have to deal with. And so how in the world uh, do you even address this? Well, it turns out that the farther you go and the more and more fossils you discover, the more difficult the fossil record becomes for evolutionists. He used to believe, he believed that the, in fact, many still believe this, that the whale evolutionary fossil sequence is one of the most clear examples of evolutionary progress within the fossil record. You start out with this, like, land-dwelling creature that basically looks like an enlarged rat that runs around, and eventually you get to a blue whale. Over the course of... Well, but starting like, uh, yeah, what is it, about 50 million years ago, and then you get the full-blown uh, blue whale around 30 million years ago. So you got about 20 million years to work with, and then it got reduced to 10 million years. And then, oh, here's the lovely rat-sized, and this is the walking whale, right? So <laughs> the walking whale. And then you get uh, the modern whale, which uh, has big teeth like that. And, but this whale was uh, discovered in 2011. And it, uh, in uh, uh, the Arctic Circle, and it turns out that this whale also dates at 15 million years old. Right? So there's no time. I mean, now you have a full-grown whale that's as old as the oldest walking whale. And so it kind of messes things up for that. So the fossil record is not what you might, might think initially. As the more we learn about it, the more difficult it becomes for evolutionary progress. I mean, this could be termed the, what, the you know, walking bat. It becomes irrelevant. At, at a certain point, you start talking about nonsense, right? And so it turns out, genetically speaking, that the hippopotamus genetically is more closely related to the whale than anything else. And so uh, it's it kind of a completely separate lineage. 
and so you're like, well, it, it starts to fall apart. So fossils aren't necessarily what you think. And also, if you only got uh, 10 million years to work with, it's interesting because even in, in standard evolutionary theory, it takes a long time to fix in a general population uh, two coordinated mutations. It takes about 40 million years to fix two coordinated million uh, mutations uh, within a population, uh, assuming 100,000 individuals in the population in a generation time of about five years. So there's just no way. I mean, get from a, a, a rat-like creature to a whale, and it takes that long just to fix two mutations? It just doesn't make any sense as far as genetics is concerned. Also, what's interesting, and by the way, this is a bunch of different topics that are kind of uh, fit together as a puzzle, as you'll see, but they're not all the same. I'm going to go pretty fast, and we'll kind of make a summary at the end. But uh, uh, here's a paper that was published in 2018, just last year, and it basically said something very interesting. It said all the creatures that are alive today, all the species, pretty much, that are alive today, they all emerged at the same time. Right? They say, well, it happened about 100,000 years ago, but they said the conclusion itself is very surprising, and I fought against it as hard as I could. Why is that so surprising? Because it almost sounds biblical. All species emerging at the same time and then expanding from there. <clears throat> Everything that's alive today. But if you look, the reason why they say 100,000 years is because they assume evolutionary relationships, like between humans and chimps, and they assume uh, time divergence based on the fossil record. But if you actually look at pedigrees from real live living people or real live living chimps, the mutation rate's a lot higher. It turns out that actually everything emerged from the same common ancestor for all the different species at the same time between 3,000 and 6,000 years ago. Now we're starting to sound very biblical. Uh, and so it's really very difficult to explain this from an evolutionary perspective. There's also the problem of evolution that isn't. Everything, almost everything that Darwin looked at is evolution that isn't. You got all kinds of different dogs and cats and roses and peas and finches. And uh, all these things are evolution that isn't. And what do I mean by that? Well, Dharma observed these finches, and they're all they have different shapes of beaks, different colors, different sizes. And uh, so he thought, well, gradual evolution over time. You just natural selection. You can do all this stuff with, uh, and then extrapolate from there. But he, what's the problem is that Gregor Mendel lived at the same time as Darwin, but he didn't become famous before Darwin, but Gregor Mendel talked about front-loaded information. You have a gene pool that gives you a bunch of different options. It's like going to a bicycle shop, and you say, I like that kind of pedal, and that kind of tire, and that kind of body frame, and that kind of seat, and you put them all together, and you make a bike. And then you say, well, I want a different bike. So you go to the same bike shop, and you say, well, I want that kind of pedal over there, and, and that kind of seat, and that kind of body frame, and put together, it's a different bike. Well, it's not really, because you, had, you started with the same basic set of options, and then you can make differences from there. But the options themselves, the bike shop itself, doesn't change. And so this is what Mendel explained. He used peas famously to show how you can get a bunch of different kinds of looking peas based on the same starting point, the same original gene pool. And you do this because you can switch and match. When, the, when meiosis happens with genes, they cross over and switch and substitute chunks of themselves with other chunks just like going to the bike shop and selecting different types of uh, bike parts. The same thing can happen with living things. Same thing can happen with dogs, in fact. Dogs, a, a particular type of dog, like a Chihuahua, Great Dane, German Shepherd, or whatever, they're diff different reflections of the same unchanging, essentially, gene pool of doggy part options. And so everything started with the wolf, and you can make everything beginning with the wolf from there on out. And uh, in fact, almost all dog breeds that are alive today were produced within the last 300 years or so. You're like, wow, that's pretty impressive. But for Darwin would have believed it's because of evolution, but it's really Mendelian. And same, and well, how far does this gene pool go? Well, it's actually quite large, larger than you would expect based on modern species. Because let's say you can combine a donkey and a horse and you make a mule, which looks different. Of course, a mule is sterile, but why is a mule sterile? It's because there's a section of chromosome that's inverted. And so when that tries to line up during meiosis, it gets folded into this loop, and the loop doesn't break apart properly. It gets fragmented, and so that's what makes the mule sterile. But not all 
uh, of these hybrids are sterile. In fact, there's usually hybrid vitality. Uh, usually a hybrid is stronger and lives longer and is more healthy than either of the parent species. Like here's a liger, lion and a tiger there. And that's a pizzly, it's a grizzly bear and a polar bear. And here's a zorse, a horse and a zebra, right? And uh, these are huge animals, <laughs> bigger than either of the parents' ones, and they're more healthy and they live longer, generally speaking. Not all of them. Not all hybrids are like this. But uh, <laughs> you know what this is? This is a donkey. <laughs> a zebra and a donkey. Now, the, this is a, um, a peacock pheasant. We were talking about peacocks last week. Now, this is considered a separate species, not a hybrid. But actually, uh, it's within the same family. Pheasants are part of the same family as chickens and peacocks and turkeys. They're all part of the same family, right? And in fact, chickens seem to be right in between of everything else because you can make chickens hybrid with all these other things. A chicken pheasant, a chicken turkey, a chicken uh, peacock. They've done all of those hybrids, right? Here's a, uh, a chickpea, right? Here's a chicken peacock, right? And uh, they took 2,000 eggs and they fertilized them. And out of those 2,000 eggs, they made three chirks, <laughs> a chicken uh, uh, turkey, right? And so three of them survived. So they didn't do very well. But you can do it is the point, right? And so the gene pool, in other words, what I'm saying is that the original bird kind for this type of bird is not a species. It's a gene pool, right? And the gene pool is large. And what was actually on Noah's Ark was not a turkey or a pheasant or, or a peacock. It was something that was ancestral to that that produced all of those things or could have produced all of those things. It's a huge gene pool. This is a geep, right? A sheep combined with a goat makes a geep. And they have different numbers of chromosomes. The, uh, the uh, genus Ovis will, uh, is a sheep, has 54 chromosomes, while goats have 60 chromosomes, and yet they can make viable hybrid offspring called geeps. Here's another geep, right? You hate to be this animal when there comes to be God separating the sheep from the goats, right? <laughs> Here's a, a puma pard, an uh, intergenus hybrid between a panther and a puma. So what's the limit? Well, it turns out that for animals, this is different for plants and other creatures, but for animals, the limit is between um, orders and family. You, there's no intraordinal hybrids for animals. So be, below that, though, it's not just like the origin of the species. It's really the origin of the families. It's a familial gene pool that can give rise to interbreed and all these things. It's a large gene pool. And, uh, but, you know, sometimes you go too far. And then... <laughs> I believe this is this is a, a peacat. <laughs> so anyway, but and there's other ideas too. There's what I call type one evolution, which is devolution. In other words, which came first, the top fish or the bottom fish? Always, it's the more complex one, the things with more parts. That always comes first in the gene pool. You can easily lose parts, but it's much harder to gain them back or to gain them to begin with. And uh, same thing goes, well, you know, here's a positive mutation. You get sickle cell anemia, but you get resistant to malaria. Well, it's actually a, a degeneration. It's a single point mutation. You, you switch an A for a T, and then it produces a different protein, uh, glutamine versus valine. But it makes it so that it can't hold oxygen as well, and so that's why the parasite can't live in there as well. But it's a detrimental mutation. You lose function in order to, to gain your benefit. Well, that's very easy to explain. It's much harder to go the other way. Flightless birds, which came first, the flightless bird or the flighted bird? It's the flighted bird. It always comes first because it's more complex. It's easier to go downhill. This is a toxin injector, type 3 secretory system, toxin injector, part of bubonic plague, all these bacteria that are really lethal. They have these toxin injectors. But where did they get the, where did the injector come from? Did the injector come first, or did something else more complex come first and then degenerate into the injector, the toxin injector? Here's the flagellum, which has uh, 40 parts. The toxin injector has 10 parts that also res are, come from the flagellum. They're the same parts of the flagellum. But it's only 10 parts versus 40 parts. Which came first, 
the 40 parts or the 10 parts? The 40 parts came first. And uh, the flagellum is very complicated. It's uh, like an outboard motor, and it can go forward and backwards. Uh, it can stop and reverse within a quarter turn, 100,000 RPMs per, uh, 100,000 rotations per second. Anyway, it's an amazing little machine. Well, this came first, and then the toxin injector came after that. And that's actually been proven the <laughs> uh, last five years or so. And so it's kind of like this car, you know. It's, uh, this car is still functional, right? It's not like not functional just because it has no wheels anymore. Somebody came and ripped off your tires. You could still use it as a giant flashlight or a stereo system, right? <laughs> It's still functional. It's just uh, devolution, you know. It just devolved. It doesn't mean it's not functional. Uh, what about the crocodiles? You know, it turns out the Bible talks about these vegetarian animals that you're like, well, the Bible's crazy. You know, lions eating straw like an ox. Well, it turns, turns out that this year, in June 2019, they found out that the majority of fossil crocodiles uh, in the fossil record are actually vegetarian. Right? You're like, crocodiles being vegetarian? <laughs> That's kind of hard to imagine. But they have these vegetarian teeth. And you're like, well, that's very interesting. So uh, it starts to make, the Bible starts to make more sense, like it has more predictive value. The majority of the animals before the flood are vegetarian, and they started to devolve because the vegetarian diet is more or less complex than the median diet. It's more complex. It takes more enzymes. It takes more complicated uh, gut structure and also uh, 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 salivary structure and all that is more complex. There's also vegetarian spiders. You're like, well, that's strange, vegetarian spiders. But there are. So uh, there's all these different things that are starting to make sense, like how could God possibly make everything so it's not harmful? Well, evidently there's some support for this. You know, the wolf and the lamb uh, doing fine together, lion and the lamb, all these things doing just fine, and they're all eating straw like oxes. So that's pretty cool. Tim, thanks. So also bacteria. What about bacterial resistance? That's clearly evolution in action, right? But most forms of bacterial resistance are due to a loss of function. For example, most antibiotic resistance, uh, the way the antibiotics work is like a lock and a key. You know, you got this uh, lock and the key comes in and it fits just right within that lock and it turns it and the antibiotic is able to kill the bacterium. So how does the bacterium become resistant? Well, all it has to do is change one of the numbers of the lock, just one of them, by random, and it becomes resistant. Like stick out a finger, and uh, it can't bind as, the antibiotic can't bind to its target very well, and it gains resistance. That can all happen overnight. That's why antibiotic resistance is such a problem in the medical community. So this is really based on a loss of a pre-existing function. Lock and key work just fine before. Change one of the numbers, it doesn't work anymore. That's a loss of function, a pre-existing function. So it's just like breaking Humpty Dumpty. It's very easy to break Humpty Dumpty, but it's much harder to put them back together again. Every child knows this, right? <laughs> From early childhood. So what's the problem? Why is it so hard to put them back together again? It's because of this problem of sequence space, just like Galentner was, David Galentner was talking about it in the beginning. It's about genetics. It's a genetic problem. And sequence space is a space that holds every possible permutation that you can think of that exists. And which ones are beneficial and which ones are not? Well, it turns out it's like three-letter words. Closer to the bank, they're more commonly beneficial. The odds of random mutating a two-letter word to find another meaningful two-letter word in the English language system is one in seven. The odds for the three-letter word is one in 18. So, oh, well, it kind of doubles. Well, that's not true. It's exponential. And that's an exponential curve. So seven letter sequence is one in 250,000. Same thing happens for DNA, same thing happens for protein. It's the same problem. It gets exponentially harder and harder and harder to move up the ladder of functional complexity. And same thing happens with time. You need exponentially more and more time. There's also the detrimental mutation rate problem. Not only do mutations have an exponentially harder time finding beneficial sequences, beneficial stepping stones, but more common than not, they hit on a detrimental. If you already have something that's functional and you mutate it at random, odds are you're going to mess it up before you find something even more beneficial. In fact, the odds are really good you're going to mess it up. For example, every one of you has about 100 mutations more than your parents had. Wesley and Bradley have 100 more than I have. Uh, and they're, by and large, detrimental. As far as the functional ones, it used to be thought that about three of them were functionally relevant, 3%. 
were functionally relevant. But that's when the genome, they thought that only 2% of the human genome was actually functional to some degree. Now it's known that at least 20% is functional, and maybe more than that. Some argue as high as 50% functional to one degree or another. If it's just three, the average woman would have to have 20 children in order for two to survive without any mutations that are detrimental and give rise to the next generation. That's just three. If it's 20%, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of children in order to survive and without any mutations to give rise to the next generation. In other words, we are definitely headed downhill. I mean, how many women are doing your part, right? I know our, us men are willing, but you know, most of the detrimental mutations actually come from women or men. Most of the detrimental mutations come from men. So we're willing but unable. <laughs> so, anyway, and it, all the graphs, everything that you can think of to overcome this problem, they all eventually head downhill. We're all devolving, and we always have been, and all slowly producing creatures on the planet. All mammals, for instance, have all been devolving since they were first created, and since the fall, basically, because there's no more maintenance. God is not maintaining the gene pool, and we're devolving, and we'll eventually go extinct. So is this recognized? This guy, James Tour, if you don't know who he is, you've got to read. He's all over the Internet. He's on videos. And uh, he, he's, he even talks about his religious conversion, which is very amazing. Um, but he's one of the top ten biochemists in the world. In fact, a couple of years ago in 2018, he was named the top scientist in the world. And uh, he, for, for a living, for, for fun, not necessarily for a living, but for fun, he generates nano machines like little nano cars that are based on molecules that are so tiny that they have the Tour de France where they race across a centimeter of gold and it's equivalent to racing 2,000 2, miles. So this is really cool. He says, let me tell you what goes on in the back of science rooms with National Academy members, Nobel Prize winners. I've sat with them and when I get a chance alone, not in public, because it's a scary thing if you say what I just said, I say, do you understand all of this, where all this came from, how all this happened? And so this is what he builds, just to give you an idea. Here's his nano cars that they race around. Yeah. So he builds these things, right? And it, these are tough to build. And so he knows what he's talking about when he says it's hard to build these uh, small subcellular machines. He says, every time I've sat with the people who are synthetic chemists who actually know what they're talking about, who understand this, they go, uh-uh, no. These people are just so far off on how to believe all this stuff just came together. I sat with National Academy members, with Nobel Prize winners. Sometimes I say, do you understand this? And if they're afraid to say yes, they say nothing. They just stare at me because they sincerely can't do it. So what's the answer to this from the other side? Because no one can explain how you make molecular biomachines just come from nothing or even come from something to something else that's, that's functionally novel structurally new and functionally novel. That's just, it's like going from a, not just a seven letter word, but from a paragraph to a completely novel functional paragraph. It, it, it's like finding a, a single atom in, in universes of universes. It just doesn't happen statistically. So how, how do you explain this? Well, here's uh, Lawrence Krauss, an American theoretical physicist. Uh, he was uh, pretty popular for a while. He's gotten in some trouble lately in the University of Arizona, but he wrote a book not too long ago, A Universe from Nothing. So ultimately, this is the goal of uh, atheistic uh, scientists, is that you have to make everything from nothing, ultimately. So um, how does he explain how to do this and how everything can just come from nothing? Well, Richard Dawkins wrote the foreword to his book in 2012. He says, even the last remaining trump card of the theologian, why is there something rather than nothing, shrivels up, shrivels up before your eyes as you read the pages of this book. On the origin of species was biology's deadliest blow to supernaturalism. We may come to see a universe from nothing as equivalent from cosmology. Right? So he's equating this to the same level as uh, Darwin. Uh, Darwin's book on the origin of species, but on a cosmological level, how to explain not only how life came from nothing, but how the universe came from literally nothing. So here's Michael Kiku who's going to explain this for us. And I really like Michael Kiku. I think he's a genius. But sometimes geniuses can be uh, beautifully wrong. <laughs> 
So we'll see. And so the universe could essentially be nothingness, which was unstable, and created a soap bubble. Now you may say to yourself, well, that can't be right, because that violates the conservation of matter and energy. How can you create a universe from nothing? Well, if you cal calculate the total matter of the universe, it is positive. If you calculate the total energy of the universe, it is negative because of gravity. Gravity has negative energy. When you add the two together, what do you get? Zero. So it takes no energy to create a universe. Universes are for free. A universe is a free lunch. And then you may say to yourself, well, that can't be, right? Because positive and negative charges don't cancel out. Therefore, how can the universe be made out of nothing? Well, if you calculate the total amount of positive charge in the universe, and calculate the total amount of negative charge in the universe, and you add it up, what do you get? Zero. The universe has zero charge. Well, what about spin? Galaxies spin, right? But they spin in all directions. If you add up all the spins of the galaxies, what do you get? Zero. So in other words, the universe has zero spin, zero charge, and zero matter energy content. In other words, the universe is for free. So it seems pretty convincing. Everything you said was right. So how in the world do you get around this? If the universe comes from nothing, everything's for free? And so, well, there's one little problem. Roger Penrose uh, wrote about this, a free lunch universe with an information problem. And it turns out that there's this thing called entropy, and uh, it's based on order or actually information even, going from high information content to a low information content, or thermodynamics going from a very highly ordered state to a completely homogenized state, a disordered state, where you can't use uh, energy for work, useful work anymore. And so basically he said, in order for our universe to have the, the, the level of entropy, our battery being charged, to its current position, the way it currently is, the universe would have had to start in the Big Bang with a very specific order to it, a very specific structure. In fact, it had to be so precise, the precision of the universe had to be precise to one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123. In other words, that's 10 followed by 1 to the exponent 123 zeros. There's 10 to the 80th atoms in the visible universe. If you had to write this number down, 1 slash 1 0 0 0 0, you'd have to write zeros on you'd have to write 10 to the 43 zeros on every atom in the universe to write this number down, right? That's extreme precision. And so the information content of the universe, how do you explain that? That's what no, none of the physicists can explain. And Penrose uh, said, there's no way you can explain this degree of fine tuning. It's just nothing that's being proposed, inflammation, uh, inflation models, whatever, cannot explain where the origin of this information came from. The bang, if it was a bang, maybe it just looked like a bang, but it was an extremely precise bang, right? And so that doesn't explain the origin of the information. Something had to be there to make the information. So how do you explain away the information? This is a picture from his book where he actually quotes this number, 1 in 10 to the 10 to the 123. It's a very precise number. So it's kind of like this uh, video of... Uh, there's some sound to this, but... <laughs> so, actually, this is statistically more likely than uh, the number I previously quoted to you. The odds that every tornado that has ever existed in the planet since the planet began would have built houses instead of tearing them down is more likely than our universe being as fine-tuned as it currently is to support life. It's more likely. That's more likely. And how many would you believe that that would just happen by random chance? So, but physicists are determined that it did. This, this house being built by a tornado, that's actually what happened in real life. So what do they explain? Here's Richard Dawkins. At ease with that, as you seem to be, because it does seem to me that if there is a supernatural, superhuman intelligence that worked it all out, 
in a way that undermines the entire scientific enterprise because we are, maybe, maybe an evolutionary biologist feels this more strongly, the whole enterprise of evolutionary biology is to explain how you get prodigious complexity and design from virtually nothing. I mean, we hand over to physicists when we, we can go beyond the virtually nothing to the absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but, um, oh, he goes if, on. The, if the deistic God thought all that through and set up the laws of physics, then he would have to be damn clever. He, he would have to be a, a, the physicist to end all, fi all physicists. I don't care if he then with, withdraws. He needs an explanation in his own right. And uh, it seems to me that the noble scientific enterprise is to, is to start from as near nothing as you can get. Yep. So he needs an explanation in his own right. That's the, you know, if you can't explain the origin of God, then you're not being scientific. You have to explain the origin of everything. Or do you? You know, because this is not what really happens. What really happens is that they propose an infinite universe that's multi-universe, multiple, essentially infinite number of universes existing within a quantum computer, right? The computer itself is eternal and infinite. It can make whatever it wants, right? So they have no problem with believing in something that's eternal and infinite in power, right? Or creative power. They have no problem with those two ideas. So what's the problem with God? There's one subtle difference with God versus an infinite quantum computer. And it's that God can judge you morally, right? This is the only real difference. And you think that, oh, physicists wouldn't have a problem with that, right? But the, occasionally they become honest with themselves when they're caught up in their own argument. Because the ultimate infinite quantum computer that makes infinite numbers of universes and ours just happen to come out right with all those tornadoes making houses properly instead of tearing them down, uh, you know, because one of the universes is bound to do that. But it ruins scientific enterprise altogether because there's no predictive value to that. Anything can happen, uh, whatever. Uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. There's this interview with Lawrence Krauss, the same guy who wrote A Universe from Nothing. He had this radio interview and uh, with Briarly. He says, Briarly asked him, do you see any evidence for purpose in the universe? And Lawrence Krauss, he says, well, maybe I would believe if the stars lined up and spelled out a message from God. Like, hey, Lawrence, this is God. Just thought I'd stop by and say hi. You know, lined up all in the stars. Then I would believe, right? And Briarly, he's very clever. I was, like, impressed with him. He says, actually, no. That wouldn't be evidence for God on your multiverse view. If there are an infinite number of universes existing for an infinite amount of time, then anything can happen no matter how unlikely it is. Therefore, no evidence could convince you that God exists since the unobservable, untestable, eternal multi-universe can make anything it wants, right? This is Briarly, not Krauss. He, he's, he's just throwing the argument back at Krauss. What are you going to do with it? Your own argument. And so I was like, what is he going to do with it? And so this he comes up. I mean, he's saying, you know, you shouldn't be a surprise. Two-headed cows, ten-headed cows, angels dancing on a pin, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger winning California lottery a hundred times in a row. But nothing should surprise you. I mean, it basically wipes out science. And so how is he going to answer this? So Krauss, I have to give him credit because he was honest for once. He says, that's a true statement. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> that's a true statement. So you talk about this God of love and everything else. But somehow, if you don't believe in him, you don't get any of the benefits. So you have to believe. Then if you do anything wrong, you're going to be judged for it. Why don't we want to be judged by God? And that's the bottom line. I don't want to be judged, right? That's the bottom line. And you're like, uh-oh, this is not about physics anymore, is it? This is about philosophy. What you want to be true versus what actually is true. And it, I mean, how often does what you want actually end up being reality? You know, I want a personal jet. <laughs> I mean, doesn't my if wishes were horses, right? It doesn't mean anything. And so, anyway. We talked about numbers a little bit last week and beauty. But beauty is actually uh, quantifiable, amazingly, right, Leonard? Brand? <laughs> beauty is actually mathematical. I know you guys don't think math is beautiful, but it really is. Math underlies everything that you personally would consider to be beautiful. And I'll, I'll show you. 
this one of the things that is beautiful about math is the Fibonacci series. And this is exactly what uh, SETI scientists are looking for. They're just like, well, if a radio signal would come from outer space and the aliens would have put the Fibonacci series within that radio signal or the sequence of pi, the first 50 terms or whatever, then we would know intelligent design made that radio signal with, with those tags. And they're like, well, what's wrong with DNA then? It's got the same tags in it. In fact, the Fibonacci series, it's a very simple series. It's uh, you, you take two numbers, and you add them together, make the next number, and do the same thing. Previous two numbers, add, the add them together, make the next number. One, one, two, three, five, eight, so on. Right? And if you start dividing the two numbers together, it ends up, as you go along the series, it ends up becoming closer and closer to this golden ratio, 1.6180, etc. And you're like, well, what's beautiful about that? Well, you can turn it into spirals and rectangles, which is pretty interesting. And these spirals and rectangles have been used to build pretty interesting structures, like the Parthenon. It's considered beautiful. It's also found throughout nature, all over the place. If you're looking for the Fibonacci series tagging radio signals, well, Fibonacci series is everywhere within nature. It's in worms, cross-sections of worms, pine cones, flowers, all kinds of plants. Have this, You go one way, there's, there's 34 lines. You go the other way, there's 21 lines. Both those numbers are Fibonacci numbers. Uh, they're in seashells and galaxies, and this is uh, computer generated, but it's really not. This is, this is. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Broccoli, right? Romanesco broccoli. It's it's a fractal and a Fibonacci. It's a Fibonacci fractal. So uh, it's everywhere. It's in the human body. The ratio of the body. We have all kinds of symmetries to us, including Fibonacci symmetries, which we consider to be beautiful. Here's Fibonacci in your hand in your fist, in your ear. The face has a bunch of them, uh, golden ratios. So anything that you look at, you're like, well, what's so special about the Fibonacci series? It seems pretty arbitrary. God just liked it that way. It was For him, he programmed us to recognize that particular series as attractive, as, a, as a, an appropriate, finely balanced ratio that's beautiful. And uh, everybody will recognize it that way throughout the world. It, it goes across cultural boundaries. Uh, anybody who does paintings uh, uses this, even subconsciously. So it's like, this is arbitrary, but we all accept it as beautiful. So that's kind of interesting to me as well. So all these things for me to come together, first of all, the mechanism doesn't work. And uh, the only mechanism we know that does work is, involves intelligent design. And there's some features within the natural world that are arbitrarily beautiful based on math that you're like, well, how did that, that's just put in there just because, because it looks good. And you're just like, all these features suggest strongly that not only the universe was designed, but it was designed to be beautiful and attractive and uh, by an intelligence. And no naturalistic mechanism, certainly not the eternal quantum computer, unless you want to avoid judgment, can explain these things. And avoiding judgment doesn't seem like a very rational position to be in. I mean, if God exists and you just don't want him to exist, well, that doesn't mean he's not there. And that doesn't mean you're not going to go through judgment. In fact, the only saving grace for the Christian is that God has already taken care of judgment for us because judgment is given in favor of the saints, right? And so Christ has already come and died for us and taken care of judgment. And so we don't have to worry about it. God's taking care of all that. Somebody as scummy as me or David, King David, or anybody like that who's pretty wormy, and we all are in the same boat, that God has come and, and told us that if we will... Uh, follow him and let him take care of all that for us. He'll turn us into something beautiful, even better than Fibonacci series. So anyway, thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, this is usually my favorite time. So <laughs> I know it was a lot, right? Kind of hodgepodge random stuff, but. Um, the ever-present fear that God is somehow going to interfere with us in a negative manner because uh, we're somehow going to be limited because of God uh, stems from, from an uh, un, um, unfortunate belief that God arbitrarily demands something. Yeah, not it for doesn't, good, right? It doesn't stem from the fact of actually understanding the character of God as a true being 
who actually understands what's going on. If we truly appreciated God for who he is, we would see him as a treasure, not a threat. Why? Because he understands what's going on. Wouldn't you want to have access to someone like that? Yeah, it's, it's funny because all the cool things that we enjoy, including things that, that you don't even want to talk about that you still enjoy, God made. Like sex, for example. God made that. The only, the only thing that you go out of bounds on, uh, the only really difference between uh, uh, enjoying something in a good way and enjoying something in a bad way is that when you enjoy something in a bad way, you take something from somebody else that doesn't belong to you at, to their injury. In other words, you're willing to injure somebody who's innocent in order for you to take what belongs to them. Well, and you're like, well, that's us obviously evil. But who, who in here has not done that? Taking well, something that doesn't belong to you in order for you to enjoy something at the expense of somebody else. And uh, you're like, well, that's what we need help with. As, as just a follow-up on what you just said, <laughs> it appears to us that we're taking advantage of somebody else. But we're actually hurting ourselves in the process. Right. We just don't realize it. We're undermining the very foundation on which we stand. Cain realized it, unfortunately, after the fact. That's why God tells us the commandments. They're actually clues. Don't do this, don't do that. It's, it's, it's a clue that doing that is not going to be a good thing. Right. You know, we can claim that we have a right to do what we want to do, but does that improve? Does folly make us greater? Yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 it might taste sweet for a minute, but uh, after a while, then you, yeah, then you end up destroying Cain, yourself. Right? Cain himself realized, oh, well, now anybody can kill me too. Uh, how come that never occurred to him before? This is a problem. We think we can get away with it. But God knows that that's not the way reality works. Mm -hmm. There is a cause and a consequence. There's also a beauty to holiness. When you actually look of at yourself course. and say, I actually did that to somebody else, and you're like, that's pretty ugly, right? But when you look at somebody, like who saw the video of this black young man who forgave the, the cop who shot his brother yes. and, and went and gave her a hug. And you're Amen. like, this is a beauty you of say, Christian okay. character and holiness. This is a beautiful thing, yeah. right? See, and you, you recognize it as beauty. With that, you can build something. Right. With hatred, intolerance, and all that, you cannot build anything. Right. Uh, both um, Huxley and Gould have expressed the uh, idea that uh, they felt religion would restricted their freedom. And uh, Huxley even talked about his sexual freedom. Yeah. Uh, this is That's the uh, most common Alga, thing. This is Algis Huxley. And uh, uh, the... Uh, well, they usually talked about it in their 20s. I the was, most common reason given today for, for university students not to believe in God is because it affects their sexual freedom. Yeah. That's the most common argument. I was in Haiti uh, a few years ago, uh, returned after 50 years. I, was, I, I grew up there, uh, and it uh, uh, took me three hours to do about two miles in a taxi because everybody was driving on whichever side of the road and so on, and, and I... Uh, Random chance became impressed of how uh, unappetizing anarchy was. Uh, some of these rules are good for us, and we we try and bypass them, we hurt other people. And uh, in the long run, uh, they're for our best. Well, pe people think that rules restrict freedom, but there's certain things right. that you cannot do mm -hmm. without rules. There, there are certain freedoms you cannot have without rules. And so if you look at it in that way, rules can actually be used to enhance your freedom. 
You just can't achieve certain types of success without certain types of rules. You can't fly to the moon without certain very restrictive rules. You're not free to do that. You know, and uh, you're not free to enjoy certain features of marriage without certain rules. Uh, ju they just won't happen without those particular rules. They just, that, those freedoms will not come to you. And so it's just a, the way that you look at these rules. Are, are there uh, guidelines to enhance your freedom, or, or do you really look at them as restrictions? The people who want their sexual freedom will never enjoy uh, the things that uh, those who are faithful in their marriage will enjoy. I think it's time in a discussion such as this, at this place, Seventh-day Adventist place, to insert the great controversy. After all, all of this is good for you, it's liberty, it's not liberty, has been said before by Satan himself to Satan, to Eve, did God tell you that? It was a lie. It sounded rational. It sounded brilliant, but it was a lie. The subject of your presentation might as well have been applied to Satan himself. And God does not simply know what is best for you but he is our redeemer. Amen. And uh, because of the great controversy. Now, on that note, I wish to proceed to a rather facetious one. And the overall cordial spirit of the occasion. And I wonder whether it's the gene pool that produces the peep and the creep and the veep <laughs> as Photoshop. No, those are real. Those are all real creatures. I think they were Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> no, the peacock cat was Photoshopped, and the and the and the jackalope was Photoshopped, of course. But the other, all the other ones are real creatures, believe it or not. So uh, yeah, you can go look them up. I, I I I spent a whole day making sure they weren't on on the other because some of them look pretty, like the geep, you know, the sheep and the. Go, uh, and the goat, you're like, that's that's a real one. You know, yeah. you can go look it up. There are papers written on it. Yeah. Well, I have so. seen Azores and Azanki with my own eyes. Yeah. In so. fact, I have photos of them that, that that I took that were not photoshopped. Right. So you're like, wow, they have to be photoshopped, right? No, they're not. <laughs> so, but anyway, well, but yeah, I agree with you that the reason why this is so close and so cleverly done. The whole evolutionary theory is very well done. You have, to, you have to admit, right? It's very convincing at first approximation. You're like, wow, you know, this has got to be true. And the reason why it's so well done, of course, is because I really believe that, uh, you know, Satan, the Lucifer, the most brilliant angel in the universe, was behind it, you know. And uh, he can come up with some really, it's only a slight distortion that messes everything up. Otherwise, it looks great, you know. It looks really good, just slightly distorted, and it messes everything up. So, same for se sexual freedom. I'm, I, every red-blooded man in this room has to admit, you're like, man, she's attractive, right? Even outside your marriage, it happens. You know, you look at a woman, you're like, she's attractive. And you have these thoughts in your mind, but you have to say, this is a slight distortion in your mind. This is going to mess things up. And it doesn't have to be much of a distortion. It was just a little apple. Right? It looked great. Looked like a brilliant apple. Probably tasted really good, too, right, in the moment. But just a slight distortion, and look where we are now. Messed everything up. And millions and billions of people have ex suffered untold suffering because of that. One little slight lie that just looked good on the surface, but messed everything up. John, I really resonate with your presentation today, mainly because I have a background in science as well as theology. And it's very interesting that you moved from beauty in the natural world, design in the natural world, and your end point was in ethics. And uh, that's, that's a big jump, and a lot of uh, scientists don't allow us to make that jump. 
But um, well, they make it themselves. That's they the do thing. it all the time, yeah. but they come up with a different system of ethics called evolutionary ethics. Is that a misnomer or not? <laughs> well, it depends if it suits you. I mean, even Richard Dawkins yeah. says that, you know, basically Christian ethics are good. You know, it's not good to hurt the weak and to, yeah. uh, you know, we've evolved beyond uh, the right. tooth and claw sort of deal. Yeah. So uh, he, he actually feels it inside of himself that, that, you know, love and goodness and mercy and all those things are good things and beautiful things. He just can't explain the origin of those things. Exactly. A lot of unknowns. I would like to justify what you're doing, moving from the natural world into the world of ethics, which is the world of behavior and the world of judgment, the world of law, um, ethical law, behavior. Um, I think you can make that leap. It's not too big of a gap as long as God is in the chasm between one world and the next. And you did that beautifully. Um, because all stable ethical systems have to have a religious basis. Yeah, if you, if you ever listen to Ravi Zacharias, I, no, I he's, really, he's a well-known apologist for, for Christian apologists. Um, mm. He's Indian, East Indian. Mm. Like my friend, he's related. <laughs> no, uh, but he's brilliant. I, I think he's a pre avidist <laughs> But yeah, he's really brilliant. But he also says, uh, really, truly, it it is irrational to be an atheist and have and have ethical standards because from the atheistic position, anything goes, right? Why can't I be like Hitler and wipe out people who I don't like just because they don't look like me or whatever, right? What's wrong with that? You know, from an atheist position, it's a survival of the fittest. That should be fine. It's only if you believe that you were designed in the image of God and that you have a little piece of God inside of you that suddenly you become morally responsible. And otherwise, you have no rational basis for, for moral, responsible ethics of any kind. You, should be able to, you shouldn't be mad at anybody for doing anything otherwise. Is it possible uh, many Christians are theistic evolutionists, including quite a few Adventists, even here in Loma Linda, is it possible to be a theistic evolution, evolutionist and still believe in intelligent design? Yeah, yeah, it's possible to be a theistic evolutionist. Uh, it's just, it paints God in a very bad light. Could God have done it that way? Could have God just created a worm and then made it have legs and then grew some scales and then some feathers and over millions of years? He could have done it that way, but it paints God in a very unfavorable light. He's certainly not the God of the Bible. If you're a theistic evolutionist, you don't believe in the Christian God, certainly not the biblical God, because it paints God as evil. I mean, it makes God irresponsible, deliberately so, not because of some choice on our part, a moral choice on our part, that we rebelled against God. It makes God, in the beginning, intentionally responsible for the suffering of billions and trillions of animals, of, of innocent, sentient beings. For what reason? Capricious, right? It makes him capricious and, and evil, more, way more evil than Hitler. And you're like, well, that's possible, but it's certainly not Jesus. You know, it doesn't reflect the morality of Christ, certainly not reflected in the Bible at, at all. And so I find, I think that Christian theistic evolutionists, like here at Loma Linda, there's a bunch of, of theistic evolutionists here who claim to be Christian. I was like, you haven't thought about it long enough, Right? You just haven't thought about it. Where does your path end up? And I don't think they've gone far enough down the path. So. Uh, yes, Th thanks so much for an excellent presentation, um, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, but I'll take the, 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 the advantage of this situation to at least offer a little bit of disagreement simply about how you phrase things about um, ethics. Uh, as Christians, we have, uh, we have a tendency to assume that ethics is Christian ethics. However, um, my observation, is, well, first of all, it's not my observation, but first of all, there really genuinely are different ethical systems, and there are people who have logically thought these through. So, for example, we have people like Peter Singer, for example, um, a fellow Australian, so... And, and uh, 
And I, I believe that he is genuinely trying to logically work through what the ethical system is that logically arises from a Darwinian foundation. Uh, so I admire his work. But <clears throat> um, we do have this tendency, and, and, and I noticed it in the way you express it. I'm pretty sure you don't mean it. But we do have this tendency to say there, are, there is no ethics other than you know, the ethics that arise from this biblical worldview. But there are. And right. you, can, you can go around the world and see how those different ethics have worked out for different societies. But I think even you would agree that the origin, the fun underlying origin of those ethics within all those different societies, even within the atheistic society, and there are very good atheists who would give the shirt off their back to help you. My uncle was one of them. Uh, excellent. But I think it's because the law has been written on our hearts, on every heart of humankind, and that the ethical law of love your neighbor as yourself is inherent within us. And it doesn't matter if you're born Christian or Hindu or atheistic or whatever, that that law is, is given by God as a miracle to guide our ethical searching. Well, I agree, unless you're a sociopath. <laughs> but um, uh, this, is, this is why Christianity, when it is presented to people who have suffered under other systems, can be extraordinarily attractive. It resonates. There is something inside us that says, aha, that's right. What I've been doing isn't so right. It's a natural attraction to the beauty of holiness, which is within every person, unless you're a sociopath, right? It's inherent with every person that says, when they see that, they say, that is truth. This is the beauty of holiness. And they're going to follow that because it's attractive, naturally attractive to everybody. And you're going to say, well, where did that come from? It certainly didn't evolve. It yeah, hasn't been designed. The, the, the problem, as I see it, is that in, in these other systems, people are being offered other things that they, that they find attractive as well. You, you talked a lot about the ethical, you know, the, the, the sexual freedom thing. Um, but that, that it's not just immoral or something. It, arise, it arises from an, a foundation that says, my desires are right. Right. And that's, that can get you, that, regardless of what culture you're in, that can get you in trouble. Your desires are right philosophy ends up not being very attractive in the end. The beauty of holiness is not revealed in that philosophy. And you're like, well, it's like uh, Hitler's desires. What's wrong with his desires? Like, uh, there's this T-shirt. I was watching a, a program for this guy who uh, gave his life to Christ. He's a homosexual, very well-known, famous one. And uh, he turned around and gave his life to Christ. He's still homosexual, but not living the lifestyle anymore. And he was in this coffee shop, and he saw this, this uh, waitress wearing a T-shirt that says, uh, follow your heart. So he asked his friend next to him who was drinking coffee with him. He says, what do you think about the T-shirt? You think that's right or wrong? And and he's, he's his friend is not a Christian. He's just a, you know, um, you know nothing, no, no religious background whatsoever. He says, "Well, I think it's generally right." And this person, this converted uh, homosexual man, he says, "No, it's wrong." He says, "Hitler followed his heart. Stalin followed his heart. All these people followed their heart, and look what happened to the world around them." It's like you don't follow your heart. You know, uh, as far as you follow what intellectually you know to be true, not what you want to be true. So. Uh, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, the teachings, one of the main teachings of spiritualism is, quote, unquote, desire is the highest law. Right. Uh, Steps to Christ talks about the reason Jesus came was to remove the dark shadow that Satan had cast over the kind of person our God is, that he is a cruel judge, watching with jealous eye to see what we've done wrong and pointing his finger at us and scowling and scolding and saying, you can't do that, and restricting sexual freedom and 
um, hiding the beauty of marital uh, relationships. Um, so the other systems of ethics, they're trying to copy as much as possible of Christianity without realizing it because that's the only thing that's going to make their system at all beautiful. But it will have other pleasurable aspects. Well, there's a lot of things attributed to Christianity that are, that are not beautiful, that have been attributed to Christianity. Sure. But what is beautiful about Christianity, whenever it ends up being beautiful, it's always because you've loved your neighbor as yourself. It all, because Christ said everything, all the laws, all the ethical systems they all, that are all beautiful and that are all, all correct, they all boil down to one thing. What did you do for your neighbor? That's it. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's the only question that's going to be asked in the judgment. What did you do for your neighbor? And that's going to, that question is going to be asked of every culture, every society, whatever you grew up as, Seventh-day Adventist, Hindu, Judah, it doesn't matter. It, you know, that same question is going to be asked of every single person. And because of that question, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or non-Christian or whatever, the heathen can be saved. Paul said that, hey, the heathen who do by nature the things required by the law, and what's required by the law? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Right? If the heathen do by nature that, that one thing, they're going to be counted as savable. Right? Because they have listened to the Holy Spirit speak to them, and their heart, the law is written on their heart. That particular law is written on every heart. And that law is beautiful. It is possible, though, for it to be covered up by Satan, by sinning, and to become calloused to it. It is, but every time you see yourself drifting away from that, do I love my neighbor as myself? Every time you see yourself drifting away from that, if you listen to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will empower you to be able to do that. Yes, I was speaking of those who, like Hitler, like Judas, like Cain, they not aren't listening Eventually, you become sociopathic if you don't listen anymore. You don't care about what happens to other people. So. Where did we get the idea that feelings are somehow sacred? <laughs> well, I mean, we have institutions to train the intellect. We have gyms to train the body. And yet, whatever feeling happens to waft by, we immediately think this must be right. Well, I'm not opposed to feelings. I think feelings are important. No, 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 no. Uh, excuse me a moment. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not arguing against muscle either, but muscle yeah. needs to be trained. Yeah. Uh, intellect needs to be trained. You don't just take any idea and immediately run with it. It could be off the wall. Well, let me ask you this, though. Let's say you woke up in the morning and you told your wife, today I'm determined to love you. Come what may, however honorary you are. Right? How is that going to go over? Right? <laughs> so I, I also think that love is a divine gift as well. It's true. Because you have to, it, God, God didn't say intellectually do right things for your neighbor as yourself. He actually said to love your neighbor, which is impossible. He actually told you to have a feeling of love feeling of love for your neighbor and that's impossible you can't self-generate you could probably force yourself to do nice things for your neighbor but you can't you can't force yourself to actually like an honorary neighbor right or love them like is a different thing but to actually love an honorary neighbor that's divine excuse me (laughs) i I beg to differ (laughs) whatever we exercise we become better at if you do weightlifting you'll develop better-looking muscles. <laughs> if you uh, practice some exercises from the book, you will learn the skills that the book is teaching. Why don't we assume the responsibilities for the feelings that we do have so that we can choose the feelings we wish to have? Well, I don't think we can even choose those. What I, what I think when I have bad feelings, I think you can know when you have bad feelings, is that you have to ask for help. Divine, outside of yourself. You say, God, I have these things. I can't do anything about it. This is just the way I was made. This is how I was born. And I was like, I need some divine help to overcome this. Otherwise, you cannot like choose, I don't think, You're of yourself. I can't choose, certainly. I've, I've really, you can put forth a lot of effort to choose the right feelings, and it just won't work, at least not for me. No, it was just handed to me, and I'm accepted. Oh, you just handed to you, accepted. Well, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Always fun. So happy to have you.